Welcome to Coastal Community Church this morning. I'm excited to be here with you. I know that this has been a crazy holiday season so far, but we first want to start off by just saying Merry Christmas, and you know, I hope you had a great time uh, celebrating the Lord Jesus' birthday this past week, and as we celebrate and reflect on His coming, uh, He who was, He who is, and He who is to come, as we uh, celebrate those truths this week and remember who He was for us and who He is and who He will be. We, we just look at that with a marvelous reflection of who um, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, Jesus is. As we start this morning, I want to just uh, announce a little bit that hopefully next week we'll have live music back. Um, you know, we had several of our staff uh, have COVID, and uh, we are trying to just keep everybody safe and protected at this time. And uh, we don't want uh, the spread to continue as it's gone through our community pretty harshly in the past week and a half. So uh, hopefully uh, by January 17th, we'll be back operational and ready to go. I also want you to know that uh, next Sunday uh, will be the first Sunday of the new year, and we will be doing communion together that Sunday. So make sure that you are aware of that and um, have your communion supplies. We're going to maintain our uh, online service only at 11 a.m., and we'll have music at th that time, and hopefully we'll have um, our communion, and we'll bring God's Word as well. Thank you guys for being patient with us as we work through this scenario at our church. So this morning, what I want to do is just jump into our sermon uh, for today, and what we're going to be in is the book of Mark, and we're going to be reading the first 11 verses of Mark chapter 1. And this is the the story of the Messiah, you know, we've been talking about, behold, uh, pay attention that this Messiah who was to come, who has come, and now who is coming, and uh, we're still in this aspect of who, it, who has come and who um, has appeared to us, and we celebrated this week, and, and Mark's gospel is in a unique account of this story um, where Matthew and Luke both of those uh, gospel accounts uh, recorded the message of Jesus' birth and kind of introduced us to the story of how this all came about, this virgin birth and, and this Messiah who came to dwell among us, this Emmanuel. We now see that Mark is going to just introduce us to the, the ministry and, and the work of the Holy Spirit through uh, John the Baptist, and then leading into Jesus' ministry. And so Mark chapter 1 is a very important book because it doesn't really talk about the, the birth of Jesus, but it goes directly to John the Baptist, who we've talked about through this Behold series to Zechariah and Elizabeth and the angel coming to them, uh, announcing his birth as being a confirmation, a witness to that Jesus was the Messiah, the one that was foretold about all the way back in the Old Testament. So just a little bit of background, this, this message title today is Behold the Messiah. And the author of the book of Mark is what most scholars believe to be John Mark. He is a disciple of Peter, and most scholars think that he was the, this was the first gospel account written, and it was written in the mid-50s. He is writing in Greek, but more than likely had both Hebrew and Greek in his audience. He was a cousin of Barnabas. I want to show you this from God's Word, because a lot of people don't know this, that John Mark was a cousin of, of Barnabas, Barnabas being the one who kind of helped shepherd Peter. I mean Paul. In Colossians 4.10, it says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So we see here in Colossians 4.10 where uh, we see this Mark, this John Mark being a cousin of Barnabas, and was with Paul and Barnabas on his first missionary journey. And we see that in Acts verses 12-25. Let's read that together. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, who was also, uh, his other name was Mark. 
And so when we read this, we, we see the importance of John Mark in the ministry and work of the apostles and his writings. Uh, he was pretty much a scribe that went along with, with Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journeys. And he also wrote, um, yeah, along with um, his book, his gospel account, that he is um, that we're reading this morning, the, the Gospel of Mark. So Mark's gospel skips completely the story altogether of the Christmas story and dives straight into the ministry of Jesus. There's heavy persecution on Christians at this time. There was all this persecution happening in the mid-50s. Um, there was a lot of people trying to stamp out Christianity, and John Mark being the first gospel writer, you decided, you know what, we better write these stories down. We better make a, an account of what Jesus has done so that other people throughout time can read the work and ministry of Jesus. And so John Mark begins to write this gospel account, and it seems that Mark skips a lot of stuff in this, and he gets straight to the work of Jesus. He wants to show a highlight reel of Jesus' life. And this account is what most people believe led to Matthew and John writing a different account with the details filled in. Just because Mark, he wrote simply from the highlights of Jesus' ministry, and, and Matthew and John started looking and said, you know what? What he's saying is true, but so much happened in between these areas uh, that we need to write about and let people know about. And so Matthew and Luke take Mark's account and then ex expound upon it so that there's more truth to be revealed from it. So we have these different accounts, Matthew, of course, John and Mark, all of them writing on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Mark begins his book, though, with, a, with some critical information. He begins with John the Baptist. This is what connects this account with the Christmas story, and this is the reason why I chose this, this passage this morning, because it's a direct connection to the Christmas story as we have been told from Matthew and Luke. So Mark reveals and confirms the ministry and work of John in his preparation for the work of the Messiah. So when Jesus came, we know that Gabriel said, this is going to be the Messiah, this is the Son of God, this is the, the Son of David. Um, he is going to be the one who uh, comes and takes away the sins of the world, and he is going to be the Messiah. And Mark reveals that this is confirmation of what God is going to do through John the Baptist that Matthew and uh, Luke talk about as well. So this morning, as we get into this information about the Scripture, let's read Math, I mean Mark chapters 1, 1 through 11. So Mark 1, 1 through 11, Behold the Messiah. And it says this, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all of the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me, he, come, he who is mightier than I is coming, and that I, who who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, 
You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. So the first thing I want us to kind of figure out this morning from this passage of Scripture is, behold, when God does something, he's going to leave us no doubt. Behold, God will leave us no doubt when he's doing things. In verse 1, we're going to look at this a little bit more in depth as Mark writes. He says this, in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, if you read that, that statement in verse 1, that is not actually a complete sentence. This is more of a title. So he's kind of entitling his work right here. He's writing a title here saying, pay attention, here is what this whole book that I'm writing, this whole letter, this whole account is going to be about the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the beginning of the good news. Everything that precedes this statement here, this title, is going to be discussing the good news of Jesus Christ. Everything takes place after this statement is directly connected to the gospel. In verse 2, here is where he starts letting us know the confirmation of God in what he's doing through the work of John the Baptist as well as Jesus. So according to verse 2, it says this, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. So when we look at this account, first of all, we see a confirmation of a prophetic word from Isaiah. This is becoming fulfillment. What John the Baptist is going to be doing is in direct fulfillment to what Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. So when we look at this, this, um, this passage, according uh, to uh, Mark, this prophetic word is is one way God's going to confirm John the Baptist. The second is John the Baptist himself. So here we have this messenger who is going to be, in verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So we're going to see here that this um, confirmation is going to be that... um, He is going to come and he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And he's going to be this voice crying out in the wilderness. And we see him begin in verse 6, say he was clothed with camel's hair. He was um, uh, wearing um, a leather belt around his waist. He was eating locust and wild honey. And he preached. Uh, as one who is coming mightier than him. So we see this character develop in John the Baptist that fulfills what this is happening in in Isaiah that was prophesied. So what I want us to take a look at here is the confirmation that God is doing between Isaiah and John the Baptist fulfilling that, and then we're going to look at verses 10 and 11 here in shortly and see how even the Holy Spirit and God, the two of the, um, the parts of the Trinity are going to put their stamp of approval upon all of this as well. So first of all, let's look at this George, John the Baptist in fulfillment of, of wild honey um, and um, the, the significance of um, this. Um, he's eating he looks wild. You know, we're going to get into why is this um, significant. Um, he is uh, one who has taken a Nazarite vow, and um, how this all is going to proclaim uh, to him con- confirmation of who um, of who uh, John the Baptist truly is. Sec- thirdly. We're going to look at the dove descending on Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the confirmation there in verses 10 and 11. So look at, let's look at verse 10 and 11 right quick as well. And when he came up out of the water, meaning Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist, we see the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, 
and a voice from heaven, you are my beloved son in which you I am well with you I am well pleased. So here's these three confirmation things that Mark is bringing to our attention. One, that this book is in fulfillment, this, this passage is in fulfillment of Isaiah. It's backing up prophetic word. Two, it's, uh, it's John the Baptist himself being the witness, the one who is the voice crying out in the wilderness. It's happening in real time in their day, in their age. They are seeing it happen as this goes forth. They would have known this story, known who John the Baptist was, and he was that messenger. And then three, the Holy Spirit is going to be seen by the witnesses that were there that day descending on him like a dove. So what is the significance of this dove upon coming upon Jesus and its confirmation of all this story coming true? The dove is a very significant symbol in Hebrew history. The dove during the flood was the messenger that brought safety and was a symbol of hope and peace for Noah. In the Mosaic law, doves were used in the sacrificial system. They were the only birds offered as an acceptable sacrifice because of their perceived purity, and they were the only ones that if, if you were not wealthy or, or poor and you couldn't afford uh, a, a, an unblemished lamb, you would have to use doves or turtle doves. And they were the only birds acceptable for the the substitutionary atonement for sin. Doves further symbolized purity in the Psalms and of the Song of Solomon, stating how beautiful they were, and especially their eyes, how they were a mark of beauty and purity. Mark's Jewish audience would have understood the symbolism of the dove descending and representing the Holy Spirit. This dove coming down was a confirmation of Jesus' anointing in this story, but it also was a confirmation of of John the Baptist's work in ministry that he was fulfilling, that he was being the one who was preparing the way for the Messiah. This was all about confirming Jesus' anointing and purity in his divinity. So as we look into this story today that we've read probably uh, uh, many times throughout our life, let's read it from this uh, confirming account that Mark is laying out here, this very first thing that he starts his gospel account with is knowing that everything that happened in the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ comes down to John the Baptist preparing the way because Jesus was the Messiah. So he's going to leave us no doubt. God is going to confirm in these four ways that this Jesus is the Messiah, the one who's going to come and do the work to set people free from their sins. So he confirms it, one, through the prophet Isaiah, two, through the work and ministry of John the Baptist, three, through the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove, and four, it's going to be God's voice himself splitting forth the heavens, opening up the clouds, declaring, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He is letting his readers know God has put his stamp of approval on this event. And there is four different confirmations to help us see and put this all together, one through Isaiah, two through the ministry of John the Baptist fulfilling the the prophet Isaiah, three, the Holy Spirit descending upon him, and fourth, the voice of God himself saying, this is my son. Pay attention. Behold, the Messiah has come, and he is now working among you, Israel. That is what Mark chapter 1 is leading us to understand those four confirmations, there is no uncertainty in the mind of the Hebrew audience or in these authors of of Mark and uh, the other apostles of the day that Jesus was the Messiah and it was confirmed in those four ways. Behold, the Messiah 
has come. So as we move out of the Christmas story and we see what has happened from you know, the birth of Jesus through Mary and the story of Joseph, and uh, we talked about um, Zach- Zechariah and Elizabeth and all the events that took place that led up to this point to where the Messiah wasn't just to come and, and be born in Bethlehem, but he came to be the one who takes away the sins of the world, and he's beginning his ministry right here. Behold, pay attention. The Messiah has come. There is no doubt that he is here. And we have to remember why he came. He came to take away the sins of the world. Behold, the next point I want us to pay attention to that Mark is addressing in this first 11 verses is this, behold, sin has to be addressed. Sin has to be addressed. Verses 4 and 5 of this, Matthew chapter 1. It says, John's message here is about addressing sin. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So this message that he is preparing for the Messiah is this message of repentance from the sins of their day and the sins of the people. John's message was that the Messiah is coming. While Israel had forgotten God and while we are and we're living uh, sinful lives, God had not forgotten them. John is preparing a way. He is asking all of Judea. He's calling out to all people in the land, uh, Jerusalem, to Judea, all through the country, confess your sins and get ready for the Messiah has arrived. So sin is something that has to be addressed. When we look at Joseph's account in Matthew and Luke's account in, um, with Mary, when Gabriel comes to them and speaks to them and calls them to be the ones who bring in the Messiah, he tells them both, his name shall be Jesus, for he will take away the sins of the world. So here we're seeing John the Baptist confirm, get ready, the Messiah has come, and be willing to hand your sins over to this Messiah. Baptism in John's day had no power to forgive sins. I want to say that again. Baptism in John's day had no power to forgive sins. What was bringing salvation from sin to these people was not John in his declaration, but their faith in the one who John was proclaiming who was coming. You see, baptism was a symbol of repentance just like it is a symbol today. It was active, it was visual, it was an active visual step of faith. But God cleanses the heart upon the faith of those who respond to the call before them. And and John was not calling them to come and let him be asked for forgiveness, of that he could give forgiveness to them. He was calling them out saying, the Messiah is coming, one who I'm not even worthy to tie the shoes of, and he is going to come and baptize you, not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And when they heard that message, people began to feel the conviction of their sins and began to repent because they had faith not in what John can do, but in the Messiah that was to come. So this this story leads us now to see, behold, pay attention, this Messiah is going to address sin and he's going to take it away 
from the, from the world. Sin in our day still needs to be addressed. You see, in our time, we are not looking to the Messiah like the, the time that the Messiah, I mean, that the Israelites were doing uh, at Jesus' time here. Jesus has already come. And our faith is not on what he will do, as in John's day, but our sin today is dealt with and addressed by what Jesus has already done. And so when we look at this passage and we start to unfold the, the very active thing that needs to be addressed in our life, in our step, is that the recognition of sin in our lives. Sin, according to the Bible, is defined as knowing what is right and not, and, and not doing it, to him, it is sin. Now, we have two different types of sin that we can talk about. It's called sin of omission and sin of commission. Sin of omission, meaning sins that you don't even know that you have done. Uh, it, you may have been offensive to someone or to, to God himself, and you not even know it. And that's a sin of omission. Then we have sin of commission. Those are sins that we actively know that we are involved in and we do them. And oftentimes we do those brazenly. What we have to be careful of and what we need to understand is when we are called to repentance, it's, it's this life that we hand over to the Messiah and we say, you have dealt with my sin now help me turn away from my sin. And that's what we're going to be getting into with sin still needing to be addressed, and the Messiah is the only one who can address them because he's the only one that can take them away. You see, it was Jesus' work on his life ministry, starting from this point in Mark, going through his temptation, living out his temptation perfectly, so that he could become the perfect sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. Oftentimes, we forget about the cost of sin and what it took to take it away. And then we live arrogantly in our lives thinking, oh, well, we can just do whatever we want because Jesus has dealt with it. But this word repent, this word repent, it doesn't mean that we can kind of just keep our, our, our feet on the fence of the sin in our life. But it, it's this active acknowledgement that sin is wrong and that we should try to do our best each day to turn and walk away from the sin and put Christ first in our lives. You see, this baptism that John was calling these people to to this day wasn't a baptism of salvation, but it was, it was a call for them to take a step in faith in the one who was going to come so that they would understand he was coming to take away their sins. And we see here that many people from all over Judea and Jerusalem were going out and being baptized in the River Jordan, not just getting baptized with water, did you notice that? It says in verse 5, at the very end, it says, confessing their sins. You know, that confession is the acknowledgement that I am doing wrong and that I need to change. You know, so many times when we have that conviction come upon us, we tend to try to to uh, turn it away from us. We try to block it out in any way necessary. And what God is saying here and what he's doing through the Messiah and what he's doing through the one who's preparing the way for the Messiah is he's saying the serious need for us to address our sin in our life and to confess it, to acknowledge it, to own it, to take personal responsibility, and to try to change. And it's not means that we'll do it perfectly, but he says you need to be attempting in faith to live it out. 
And Jesus is going to give us a helper to do so. So, what we need to understand, first of all, is, behold, he's leaving no doubt that Jesus is the Messiah, but pay attention to this part, too. He's going to be our Messiah. He's going to take away the sins of the world, but pay attention. Behold, confess your sins. Deal with the sin in your life. Own it, take responsibility with it, and repent from it. Secondly, I mean, uh, thirdly today, it's behold, the Messiah comes to baptize, not with water, but the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Behold, the Messiah, baptism with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6 and 8, Mark is revealing the true humbleness of John the Baptist here in verse 6 through 8. He is uh, being shown not worthy of of being the one who ties this Messiah figure shoes. Let's read this. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes who, one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to uh, stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So this passage, we see that while John the Baptist is this popular figure, this, this voice crying out of the wilderness, this one that Isaiah had proclaimed and said, be on the lookout for, he is the one who is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. We see that John the Baptist is carrying out this calling in a very humble way. Number one, he's living out in the wilderness. He is not trying to be near the temples. He's not trying to be near the city centers. He's not trying to, to become a high priest or a scribe or a Pharisee or any of the religious leaders of the day. He was secluded. He was out into the wilderness, and he was out doing the call and work uh, that he was called to do by God, and he was doing so humbly. He was out in the wilderness and then we see him dressed with this camel's hair, and he wore this leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and honey. This is a weird description of, of John, and people of their day would have saw this as being something that was awkward. Um, however, we see back in the story of of Zechariah and Elizabeth that their son was to take the Nazarite vow. He was entailed, uh, he was uh, set apart by God to be pure and would have to take this vow of, uh, of doing certain things, having certain, uh, uh, I would say, um, dietary laws that he would need to fulfill in order to come to be this figure that God had called him to be. So what is this Nazarite vow? It entailed the dedication of his whole life to God. The external principle of a vow consisted of three things. First was abstaining from all products of grapes, including wine, fruit, the fruit of the vine, or fresh or dried. So he couldn't even have raisins. This guy could not have anything to do with grapes. Secondly, he had to allow his hair to grow unharmed by a razor. Then thirdly, abstaining from coming near anything unclean, especially like uh, a dead body or any type of uh, uh, dead things. He was to stay away from. The Nazarite vow was a highly esteemed among the Hebrews. We see that in Amos chapter 2 and Lamentations chapter 4. In this case of John the Baptist, he had to have his mind and thoughts clear and pure that the Holy Spirit may use his ministry to lead the Israelites to repentance. 
So this vow that he was taking, it was all about purity and being set apart so that he could fulfill his calling to bring in and usher in the Messiah. And we see that being carried out in this passage. Baptism. He came and he's going to talk about baptism. John baptized in water. And he says, the one who is coming before, I mean, after me, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. So as great as his work and his ministry was, he basically says, I am insignificant. I'm not even willing to be, I'm not even worthy to be the slave or the servant of the one who is coming. And again, it shows his humility. It shows his, his standing and his uh, willingness to be obedient to his calling. And then we see that he says, I'm going to baptize you with water, but he who is coming and who has come will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So when we read in verses 9 through 11, let's read those together really fast. Verses 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven calling out saying, You are my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. So we see this baptism take place and we see Jesus having this affirmation, this confirmation over his life and that he's going to be the one who not comes and baptizes with water like John, but he's going to come and baptize with the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of different teachings throughout Christianity of what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's several different positions you can take. I encourage you to look over those. There's a lot of different um, perspectives and opinion throughout um, uh, Protestantism, and you can kind of, you know, filter through and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Here's what I'm going to present to you today as being biblical in my mind, and it helps me keep my focus on what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? He's going to come and baptize us in the Holy Spirit. First of all, I want to see, I believe Scripture presents that there is only one baptism that we have. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we come to faith. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says this, For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. So there are some teachings out there to say there's multiple baptisms of the Spirit. Scripture, I don't believe, teaches that. I believe that 1 Corinthians 12 says you are going to be uh, baptized once in the Spirit when you come to faith and then once you come to the acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is, confess your sins and repent, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, Greek, slave, or free. You are baptized once in, by the Holy Spirit, and then you are put into the body of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. You become adopted into His family, not because of anything you've done, but because you've been baptized and the Spirit of God has fallen upon you. All who were made to drink of this was done of one Spirit. So um, we see that there's this one Spirit aspect from Scripture. Being filled with the Spirit of God is the biggest, uh, some of the biggest controversies throughout our, our time. There will be, um, I believe being filled with the Spirit means this. There will be a noticeable difference in one's life that will lead you to make Christ known as you have become known by Christ. So when you become filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to see this regeneration of your life. 
where you're no longer going to be about yourself, you're going to start making your life more about what Christ has called you to be and do, and that's to make him known. The first meaning of being filled with the Spirit of God is the noticeable difference in your life before Christ to after Christ and how your priorities change. Because all of a sudden, when the Spirit of God falls upon you, you want to live in obedience to that, to that Spirit. The second meaning is that you will re- receive power to be witnesses. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So I want to read that with you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says this, But when you receive power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So when this Holy Spirit comes upon you and you are baptized in this Holy Spirit, you're going to receive power. Now, a lot of people say, well, that power is is going to give me power to do miraculous things. And I'm saying here, here's what I want to say. It's possible. God is God and he can do whatever he wants. I don't believe that there is anything that it can limit God in using you to do powerful things. But every power that is given to you through the Holy Spirit has one purpose. And that is to make you a witness to testify and exalt the name of Jesus. So if you're doing anything, if you're receiving any power to do anything, it, the, the whole point of the Spirit's power coming upon you is so that you can proclaim and exalt His name. It has nothing to do with having um, uh, you know, special abilities that uh, you get to go and use for yourself and, and you get to use it whenever you want. I believe that's very dangerous theology and, and very dangerous practicality of, of living. Uh, I think everything that God uses here, when this power comes upon us, the Holy Spirit, this baptism of the Spirit, is that He's going to give you the words, He's going to give you the means to go out and do the ministry He's called you to do to make Christ known. And He can do that in multiple different ways, however He chooses to. I have seen God do miraculous things from healings to, um, uh, you know, the um, work in in people's life, provision, supernatural provision. I've seen those things take place in my life. I would never talk against it. However, every case that I've been a part of had to do with people coming to know Christ. It was about making him a witness and exalting his name so that they would know who he was. And it had nothing to do with making me special or making other people around. It was. It always came back to making Jesus known and people receiving who he was. So as we look at this power of the Holy Spirit, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's one baptism and the whole purpose of that baptism coming upon us, the whole reason why the Spirit comes to us is so that we could be witnesses and exalt his name. And thirdly, the Spirit comes to lead us to truth and to convict us of our sins. So this baptism of the Holy Spirit, we see in John chapter 14 and 16 that the purpose of this Spirit coming is so that the Holy Spirit can come live in us, regenerate us, and point us to truth through the reading of God's Word and to the conviction of our sins so that we may change who we are and to live um, as best we can to be more like Christ. Jesus the Messiah has come to take away the sins of the world and to baptize us with the Holy Spirit so that we may live faith-filled lives that exalt the name of Jesus. That's why he came. That's what we just celebrated, is that he came to live on the earth so that we may have forgiveness of sins, that he may take our sins away, 
but to also come dwell in us so that we can become more like him and make his name known throughout the nations. He's given us that power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist prepared the way. Isaiah prophesied of his coming. John uh, uh, prepared the way for Jesus' coming. And now Jesus is launching his ministry here in Mark chapter 1. And we're seeing the fulfillment of God's hand of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, becoming the Messiah, the one who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, pay attention, the Messiah was to come. He has come. And next week we're going to be talking about, and he will come again. Coastal, as we go into this uh, season this year, uh, I pray that our hearts would be attuned uh, to what God's doing in this world. There is some crazy things happening. And we get all fixated on the, the big, massive scenarios that are going on in uh, cities and college campuses and, and uh, news articles and newsrooms and, and world stages. But listen, as believers in Jesus Christ, our focus, our goal is to exalt his name. And he's given us the Holy Spirit. And he's given us power through the Holy Spirit to make his name known to that lost world that is living in fear. They're living in confusion. They're living in distraction. And God has peace for them as he's given us peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding. And may we use that peace, that self-controlled, the fruit of the Spirit that God has given us and let us walk that out every day, proclaiming his name, for that's why he baptized us in the Spirit of God, so that we can make his name known. This week, will you make his name known? As you celebrate this new year coming in, as we begin to, to set aside 2020 and look ahead to 2021, we don't know what's going to happen but we know what God's called us to. Will you make his name great? And will you exalt him? For he has come to take away your sins and the sins of the entire world to those that will believe. Let us be a part of that mission and strategy and work going into this year. And as we go in uh, this end of this week and celebrate. Please be careful, be safe, don't do anything crazy. Um, watch out for your family. Keep uh, home if you're sick. Stay healthy. And let's close today with a prayer for those in our church body that are going through illness, that are going through different um, struggles, and um, may May we ask God to uh, provide and meet their needs this, this week. Uh, let's close in prayer with that. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are and what you have done. And I pray today, God, that you would just be with those individuals in our church that are struggling with COVID, that are struggling with uh, other sicknesses and even financial uh, burdens. Lord, even uncertainties of jobs. And, and Lord, I just pray, God, right now that you would just have your hand upon our church body and that your love would be overshadowing them and that they would feel your presence with them in mighty ways. And Lord, I pray also for our church this week as we go out and we do the things that we do each and every day. I pray that you would use us to make your name great. Help us, Lord, to be used by you and to be baptized Lord, um, uh, into your body, doing the work of your body, being your hands and feet, being who you've called us to be. Help us to fulfill our callings, each one of us different and unique, but Lord, may we do so to work for together for the good of your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Remember, next week we'll be having our Lord's Supper. Please have your, your stuff available. 
and uh, we'll see you next week. God bless you. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. God bless you.